Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURGE, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Cram Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. We've done a couple of tutorials on measures of risk. So there's a part one and part two. And uh, I suspect some of you may not have heard the part one and part two, but it's on the internet. And uh, I'd suggest that when you have uh, some time, um, we look, look up those um, lectures. Um, in part three, we're going to focus mainly on what we call time to event data and hazard ratio hazard ratio as a measure of risk. Uh, I will, however, refresh uh, our memories uh, of what we discussed in part one and part two. I will go through it fairly um, quickly, so we're not um, uh, dwelling on what we've already covered um, for too long. So, there we go, right. So, what have we learned before? So, I'll give you a little scenario here. So, you're looking at um, a specific cancer where you're comparing two treatments, a new treatment, which is in the top row, and a standard treatment in the bottom row, and you've got 100 patients in each group, and you find that five years, the cancer-specific survival with the standard treatment is only 50%, 58 out of 100 have survived five years, while in the new treatment, uh, you've got 75 people that have survived. So that's the data you've got at the end of a trial comparing um, two different treatments for a specific cancer. And the uh, primary outcome being five-year cancer-specific survival. Right, so odds ratios. If you're going to use odds ratios, uh, then what does that mean? Is the ratio of odds, uh, ratio of two odds. One is the odds of survival of the new treatment to the odds of survival in the standard arm. So the standard formula of odds ratio is AD or BC. A, B, C, D are the uh, names of the cells in this two by two table. And um, you do the calculation and you come up with an odds ratio of three. Just keep in mind that odds ratio provides you with an inflated estimate of risk. It's not a, a measure that uh, we would advise that you use in a cohort study or a randomized controlled trial. And ideally, you use uh, odds ratios uh, where there's no other option, i.e. a case control study. Right. The next measure of risk that we talked about before is relative risk, which is simply the ratio of two probabilities. One is the prob probability of surviving in the new uh, treatment group, and the second is the probability of surviving in the standard arm. So the probability of surviving in one group is simply A over A plus B, and the probability of surviving in the standard treatment arm is C over C plus D. So essentially, uh, that's the formula for relative risk, and you get a value of 1.5. So relative risk is a uh, very useful measure of risk, it's very intuitive, easy to understand, and you can simply translate it as 1.5 times increased risk. The next measure of risk um, we talked about in part two um, uh, is what we call the attributable risk. It's also known as the risk difference. So it's AR or RD. So that simply is the increased survival you get that you can attribute to the new treatment. In other words, it's just a difference in the probabilities. So you go, you get uh, A over A plus B, that's the probability of surviving in the new treatment arm, and C over C plus D, that's the probability of surviving in the standard arm. You subtract the two probabilities, you get uh, what we call the risk difference or the attributable risk. Okay, so uh, carrying on with the same example, we also discussed um, what we call relative risk reduction which essentially is the reduction in death in the new uh, treatment arm relative to the standard arm. So essentially what you're saying is you want to look at the um, event rate in the control group, which is a standard treatment, event rate in the experimental group, which is a new treatment. You subtract them and you see what is it relative to the control arm. And so if you do the calculations here, you get a, a relative risk reduction of 50%. And uh, the next uh, parameter is absolute risk reduction, which simply is the difference, is the absolute difference in the death rates. So it's just the uh, difference between the uh, event rate in the control group 
and the event trade in the experimental group. Now you will see that the absolute risk reduction um, is a very similar concept to attributable risk or risk difference. If you go back one slide, you will know we, we talked about attributable risk. So that is very similar to absolute risk reduction. It's just that attributable risk is used more often in epidemiology where you're attributing the risk of a particular risk factor like smoking to say lung cancer, for example, while absolute risk reduction is used in clinical trials where you're looking at the effects of um, interventions on clinical outcomes in patients with a particular disease like cancer. We then talked about number needed to treat, which is essentially the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. And that's a useful statistic to keep in mind because it gives you the number of patients that need to be treated with a, with a, with a, with a special, uh, with the new treatment for 1% to benefit. So when we say that NNT is the reciprocal of absolute risk reduction, we mean in this particular example, it is one over 25%, uh, which is four. So you're saying that four patients need to um, be given the new treatment for one person to see a benefit at five years. And that usually um, uh, an NNT of four in cancer trials is a pretty significant number. Right, so we then move on to um, explaining time to event data. So um, we have talked about a number of measures of risk and we've considered uh, uh, outcomes which may or may not be related to um, timing. So for some outcomes, you could ignore the time. The timing is not very important. And uh, sometimes you could specify that the outcome has to happen within a certain time period and not worry too much about when in that time period the outcome has occurred. And the examples would be things like wound infection after surgery, an astomotic leak, flap failure, reoperation for bleeding, 30-day mortality, and so on. So you can see here that um, you probably have come across studies that use 30-day mortality as a primary outcome. And uh, the question there is, you know, how many patients have died within 30 days after surgery? And we're not really interested, neither the surgeon nor the patient is bothered about whether the death happened on day five or day 11 or day 19. So in these kinds of events, um, relative risk, odd ratios, um, risk reductions and so on are pretty um, uh, sufficient and useful. However, there are some events and outcomes where the time is really important. The time should not be uh, ignored. And examples of those would be survival and recurrence rates, um, mainly in cancer trials. And uh, uh, we go back to the same example, the hypothetical example, where we look at cancer-specific survival in this particular cancer uh, where patients have been subjected to two different treatments. And uh, I first show you, showed you data on five-year survival, but here in this um, figure table, you've got two-year survival, five-year survival, and 10-year survival. And depending on which um, time point you choose, you will find that your relative risk or any other measure of risk will change over time. So it would be 1.1 at two years, 1.5 five years, and one at 10 years. Or eventually, you know, everyone of us will die. So uh, you could argue that if you have a very long uh, um, endpoint um, for survival, then the relative risk will become one um, in whichever trial setting you look at. So therefore, for these outcomes like survival, the measures of risk that we've discussed so far, relative risk, odds ratios, and so on, have significant limitations. Right. So let's just think of an example, uh, uh, another uh, but similar example. Let's say you're studying um, an event such as survival, and let's talk about disease-specific survival, after um, pancreatic surgery in a cohort of patients that you've recruited over three years. So you're interested in survival uh, after pancreatic surgery. Now, you've got to keep in mind that the survival incorporates the event and the time of occurrence. So you want to know whether they've survived or not, and you also really want to know how long they survived for. So there are two components to this, um, to this kind of data and this kind of analysis. You could either just focus on the survival as a binary outcome and think of it as whether people have survived or not survived, and, and consider a fixed time point 
So, for example, you could say 20% survived five of, um, two years. So, you're not really saying what happened um, after two years for the 20%. Did they live on forever? Were they cured? Or were they all dead by three years? At the same time, you're not saying much at all about the 80% that died by the second year, whether they died as a result of complications or surgery within the month, or whether they all died towards the end of two, uh, towards the end of the first year. So there, there are significant problems. So this bin binary way of looking at survival does not really capture changes over time. The other way is a more quantitative uh, way, which, which appears sort of logical. And you'd say, fine, I'd want to look at the length of survival in every one of my patients that I've recruited over three years. I'd then calculate the average survival and give you the median and the range. A median and the range more than the mean and standard deviation because survival in these kinds of physics scenarios is almost always a non-parametric data set. And if you have any questions about it, um, let me know at the end. So what's the problem with this? The big problem with this, a practical problem, is what we call censoring. Now, you might um, collect patients over a three-year period, and then you might study them for um, another two years. But it may be that a, a significant number of patients have not died at the end of your five-year study. And then you don't know how long they would have survived for, because you've got to you finish the study at some point. Or it could be that another event not of your interest has come into play. What does that mean? So you said, or I said, that you're interested in disease-specific survival. So you're interested in patients who die of pancreatic cancer. What happens to patients who've either migrated or who've had a chest infection or a PE? So what do you do to those patients? So if they have a PE at three years, uh, which if you assume is completely unrelated to the pancreatic cancer, you know, it could be, and that's a difficult sort of debate. Um, so you um, are not able to say that the patient died of pancreatic cancer at three years. You're just able to say that the patient died of some other cause or, or of some cause. So these are problems uh, if you look at survival data purely from a quantitative perspective. Um, in other words, you're having to censor uh, the data of some of these patients if they've not had the outcome of interest. Right. There are some other practical issues with time to event data. So um, as you would probably realize, the patients do not um, get recruited all in one go. So if you start the study now, you're not get, going to get all of your 50 patients uh, within the next month. They will be recruited over a long time period. And we're saying three years. And therefore, their start times will be different. But you're going to finish the study at five years. So you've said probably that uh, your last patient will have a two years follow up. But your first patient is going to have five years follow-up. So the length of follow-up will be different um, for uh, the entire group. The other um, practical issues are that we do make some significant assumptions when we start analyzing time to event data or survival data. And uh, these, these are the assumptions. The first is that we have to assume, or we do assume in a lot of these studies, that the prognosis does not change over the time of recruitment. So uh, if you're recruiting patients over three years, patients having pancreatic surgery, uh, you are assuming that your procedure, the treatment providers don't really change, and the patients um, entering into the trial early on are very similar to the patients entering into the trial later on in, as far as prognosis is concerned. So that sometimes can be a big assumption to make and may not always be valid. The other big assumption is that you assume that the patients who are censored are very similar, primarily in terms of prognosis, to patients who are not censored. So uh, uh, again, censoring can happen because of all sorts of reasons um, related to the cancer, unrelated to the cancer, and that uh, those reasons or those confounding variables might themselves affect the prognosis. So again, that's a big leap of faith to make, uh, and that's a significant assumption you need to bear in mind. Okay, so now that we've discussed a little bit about time to event data or survival data. Uh, let's look into the measure of risk uh, that we can use for these um, data sets. So hazard ratio is the measure of risk that we're going to talk about, and that's used in time to event data. Right, so what does that mean? So as the word says, hazard ratio is a ratio of two hazard rates. 
So what is the hazard rate then? The hazard rate is simply the rate of event, i.e. death here, in a cohort in a unit of time. Now this is a very simplistic description of hazard rate. So you want to calculate the rate of event in two groups, and then you want to calculate the ratio of the rates of events in two groups. So it's very uh, similar in concept to the relative risk. Now here's a um, survival curve, and we will talk about survival curves and survival an analysis in a separate tutorial. But you've got um, two groups of patients with breast cancer, and we're plotting time to death or metastasis. So that's a complex outcome, death or metastasis in months, and we're plotting the survival. And the two groups of patients are those um, without lymph node involvement in blue and those with lymph node metastasis in red. And you can see how the survival obviously um, drops as you go down the periods. And you can also see how the lines are diverging from each other. Now, if you wanted to use a simplistic measure like relative risk, it just won't work because in the first year, the relative risk uh, of death in the two groups would be one. In 10 years time, it'll be hugely different. It will be almost two. And with lots of other relative risk measures in between, depending on what time period you choose. So uh, you can see very clearly that relative risk or odds ratios for absolute risk reductions and numbers needed to treat will all depend on your endpoint. Is it one year, two years, five years, or 10 years? And that is what uh, the hazard rate tries to capture, the hazard rate and the hazard ratio. Now, the precise calculations of hazard ratio um, is a bit complicated, especially when you have what we call censoring. Um, censoring. So we won't go into the details of calculating the hazard ratio. As opposed to relative risk and odds ratio, which um, if you've seen uh, the first and second tutorials are relatively straightforward. Right. So um, hazard ratio, like I said, is um, very similar in concept to relative risk. And it's clearly preferred in analysis of time to event data or survival data because it is independent of predefined times or endpoints. There are some problems as with all of these measures of risk. The first problem is that just like relative risk, it does not really reflect absolute values. Um, it's just a ratio. It could be two, it could be five, it could be six. It doesn't really tell you what's the survival uh, in one group um, and what's the survival in the other group. So in other words, it does not by itself provide information on the average survival in both of these groups. And it is always advisable to use the uh, or describe the average time to event or the median time to event in the groups. And you could calculate what they call median ratio alongside the description of the hazard ratio. Hazard ratio is a basis for, um, you might have heard of this uh, phrase, Cox proportional hazards analysis and other survival analysis. So uh, it's important to try and uh, get to grips with just the concept. You don't um, really need to calculate hazard ratio. Um, you can get um, software to do it. So that's the end of the, the tutorial. So I hope um, I've emphasized enough that time to event is quite important for some outcome measures, such as survival and recurrence. And the moment you start, uh, you introduce time to event, and not just the event, uh, you, you're introducing complexities. Because one, you've got two parameters now, the event and the time taken. And then invariably in clinical studies, you will have significant censoring. So hazard ratio is a good measure of risk for comparing time to event data. And uh, as long as you remember that um, uh, conceptually, it tells, it gives you the same information as, as relative risk, and that will be fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.